Good afternoon. Welcome to today's lecture. Today we're going to talk about the origins and growth of industrialization. This is going to be about how the world becomes industrialized and it's not going to contain everything but it's going to give you a decent understanding of what's going on. Now for early industrialization, uh, this is going to be roughly speaking 1750 or so where it starts and industrialization is going to begin in Western Europe, specifically Britain, uh, because of a couple in advantages. One is an independent middle class and another reason is the industrial revolution that we have talked about in a previous lecture. Britain, by the way, has some additional advantages. They have coal ore, they have iron ore, they also have overseas colonies and a global trading network. Uh, the reason this is important is it gives Britain money, capital, it gives Britain supportive laws for economic development, there's a strong banking system in Great Britain, Britain also has a growing population and a growing population is needed um, to support this industrial re revolution. And the population creates a need for both food and goods. So there are a couple of different ways that population is going to play into this. And the picture here that you see uh, it shows where some of the major British coal fields were in the 1800s. Now there are some new inventions that happened between the years 1700 and 1800 and these are all involved in the textile industry. Uh, the textile industry is really the first industry that's going to get industrialized if you will. In 1733, an invention called the flying shuttle is created, and that allowed for the weaving of wider fabrics. 1764, we get the spinning jenny, and that let one operator operate eight spools of thread at once. So you could spin more thread at one time, increases your output. When we get to 1769, we have something called the water frame. And instead of using human power to spool up the thread, it would use water power. 1779, we get the spinning mule and that put the spinning jenny and the water frame together. So suddenly we have a water powered machine that can spin multiple spools of thread at once. And then 1787, we have the steam powered loom which is what would turn thread into finished cloth. And the fact that it's steam powered is important because it can be anywhere that you can get water to it. It no longer has to be along a running stream. The power loom can be placed anywhere. So how does this industrialization spread? Uh, well, originally, as I was mentioning, the factories had to be near water. The creation of st the steam engine allowed factories to be built wherever labor and transportation access was located. And generally speaking, it goes from Britain across the English Channel to Belgium, then down into France, over into Germany, and eventually into Russia, although very, very late does industrialization come to Russia. Now the British colonial empire gave it markets to sell and distribute its goods. And one of those places where British goods are gonna be sold is the United States. And the United States very quickly realizes that they can start up and have a textile industry of their own. So textiles are brought to the United States 1790s and there's an interesting story here Samuel Slater you see his name on the slide he memorized the blueprints of a textile factory brought it back to New England and wrote it down and create recreated I should say the blueprints from memory and it turns out his blueprints were right 
and he was able to start a textile industry here in the United States. So by 1825, you have a pretty strong textile industry in New England. And our best example of that is really the Lowell Mills located near Boston. They opened in 1813. And the Lowell Mills were the first real factory towns located in America. Industrialization in the United States exploded after the Civil War, and by 1870, the United States is producing more spindles of thread than Great Britain was. And by 1914, the United States is by far the world's largest economy, both agricultural and industrial. Now, one more thing I do want to say about France, Germany, Belgium, all those places. All three of those places had large amounts of coal. They had a growing population. They had a large number of workers and they had a strong transportation system. But the main reason that industrialization spread slower on the European continent compared to either the United States or Britain, it's because Europe had these protective tariffs that kind of slowed down industrial growth. But once the peace of the post-Napoleonic era breaks out, then that industrialization starts to spread up on the continent. Now, later industrialization, talking like 1870s going into 1940s, some people refer to this as the second industrial revolution. And one of the hallmarks, one of the key points of the second industrial revolution is that industry switches from using iron to using steel. And this is especially true of Germany after the Franco-Prussian War of the early 1870s. And the Franco-Prussian War gave the territory of Alsace and Lorraine to Germany. And it just turns out that Alsace and Lorraine had um, good amounts of materials that could create steel. Now within Europe, Germany becomes the leading industrial power by 1914. Germany has the most modern factories and the most equipment available. Russia and Japan become industrialized for the first time during this time period and well it's mostly not by choice. Chemicals such as synthetic dyes as well as the synthesizing of ammonia become commonplace. Uh, the synthesizing, the creation of ammonia led to both modern fertilizers and dynamite. You get the invention of cheaper paper and artificial silk. And then Charles Goodyear invents something called vulcanized rubber. And vulcanized rubber allowed for increased elasticity, increased strength, and increased water resistance. So the rubber is improved and able to be used in more instances. And then you have synthetic plastics and synthetic soaps. They're invented, which led to better food preservation and better personal hygiene. We get the in harnessing, I won't say the invention because it already existed, but the harnessing of electricity and electricity is pioneered by both Nikolai Tesla, who's the gentleman on the left, and Thomas Edison, the gentleman on the right. With the work of both Tesla and Edison, uh, the transmission of electricity and the creation of electricity generating power plants is allowed. And that meant that kerosene or oil lamps that used to dot the landscape could be replaced. Oil and kerosene also find new uses with the invention of the internal combustion engine. And no longer will they be lighting sources, they will be fuel sources. And many engines will eventually run on gasoline, which is actually a byproduct of refining oil into kerosene. New communication inventions such as the telegraph and Morse code are going to allow nearly real-time communications. Prior to the invention of the telegraph, 
it would take three to four months to get information from New York to London. The Telegraph is going to lower that down to six minutes or less. There's the wireless telegraph invented by a guy named Heinrich Hertz, and that allowed for wireless communication, better known today as radio, between ships while at sea, and you could even receive transatlantic radio messages by the early 1900s, late 1800s. Now, thanks to the advances in chemistry, metallurgy, and machinery, weapons became increasingly dangerous. Uh, these things put together, the chemistry and the metallurgy and the machinery, they allowed for breech loading weapons, repeating rifles, uh, weapons that are fed by a clip, and artillery is going to follow that same thing. They're going to become more and more deadly just on a much bigger scale. And then you have the Gatling gun, which is the picture that you see here. That's going to replace the Maxim gun that was used in the Spanish-American War. With the Maxim gun, you had to actually turn a crank to repeatedly shoot the gun. But with the, the Gatling gun, all you had to do was pull a trigger and it did it itself. You're also going to get the invention of what we call big business. There are large companies like Standard Oil, uh, U.S. Steel. In Germany, you get the Krupp Steelworks. These are going to become companies that are almost too big to fail. They will control or corner certain pieces of the market, both in this country and around the world. And there are new management systems that allow for production around the clock. Instead of the owners having to be on site at all times, they're going to delegate a lot of the, the tasks to lower forms of management. And in many ways, this second industrial revolution is going to be what gives us the idea of middle management that we have today. Now, what are the economic impacts? Uh, you have the old money or the new, you have um, the upper class, the old money, and then you have the nouveau riche. Um, these are gonna be factory owners, these are gonna be bankers, merchants, people who either had money already, made a lot of money during this time, or married into money. Uh, they're about 5% of the overall population and 40% of the wealth. The middle class, or the bourgeoisie as they become to known, uh, about 15% of the population. They're typically educated, live in nice homes, they buy luxury goods, and they're divided into upper, middle, and lower middle class. The upper middle class are gonna be professionals, government officials, and merchants. The lower middle class will be um, small business owners, shop owners, supervisors, managers, things like that. And then you have the working class, by far the largest percent of the population, but they earn the least amount of money. And you may have heard the term proletariat. The proletariat are the working class. These are gonna be wage workers, hourly salaried employees, factory workers. Some of them are skilled, some are unskilled. Very often, these working class workers are doing repetitive work, dirty work, dangerous work, and there is no protection, there's no health insurance, no, no stock profits, nothing like that. Many times, these working class people are going to live in factory towns. Uh, factory towns are going to be crowded, poorly built uh, buildings are going to be on dirty and narrow streets, there's going to be lots of pollution, lots of rain, and you're going to get limited access to clean water and you're going to get quite a bit of disease as well. Uh, London, if you have ever read any of the Charles Dickens novels, maybe you took a Brit Lit or World Lit or something like that and you had to read about some Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities, uh, Tom Sawyer, 
you kind of get the idea of what these dirty and polluted cities were like because that's what he's writing about there is a lot of population growth and I have here some big population movement so you can kind of get an idea of who's moving where during this time in reality immigration and migration is a whole nother lecture so I don't want to get too detailed but the important things to know Britain population explodes there in the 75 years between 1850 and 1940 you get almost 50 million people there um, once Germany becomes unified in 1871 it gains almost 25 million people between 1871 and the start of World War I and all of these population growths well the United States also gets like 40 million new residents as well and it's all because of improved food quality increases how healthy people are agricultural advances increase the amount of food that is available sanitation is going to cut down the amount of disease and medicines are going to lower the mortality rate fewer people are dying A lot of people during this period, 1850 to about 1925 or so, move to America because America is seen as the land of opportunity and it is the most rapidly industrializing country at, at the moment until it's surpassed by Japan. Now there are some people who are really against the idea of industrialization. Uh, one of these people is Henri de Saint-Simon. He was French and he argued that private property should be distributed equally. Uh, Louis Blanc, he urged workers to fight for voting rights and he was one of the earliest proponents for the idea of right to work, that everybody should be able to earn a living. Uh, Charles Fourier, I don't have him on here, but Charles Fourier he came up with this idea of utopian communities where those that did the worst jobs got paid the most. Robert Owen, who lived in Great Britain, he urged workers to join trade unions and then he urged trade unions to strike and push for better working conditions. And then possibly the most famous of these critics, Karl Marx. And Karl's, Karl Marx also had an associate that is often forgotten, whose name was Friedrich Engels. Together, these two guys wrote the Communist Manifesto. And the Communist Manifesto in 1848 was written. Friedrich and Engels, or Marx and Engels, they had worked together in Friedrich Engels' father's textile mill they wrote about a class struggle between the bourgeoisie the middle class and the proletariat the working class and they believed that the bourgeoisie had forgotten where they came from that once upon a time the bourgeoisie had been the proletariat and they had forgotten their humble beginnings and marx and engels then said that the only way that the proletariat could gain control of their situation and gain control of their their labor if you will was through a class struggle and this class struggle would be a violent revolution where the proletariat the working class of the world would come out on top and would share equally and receive the benefits of their employment and the communist manifesto is pretty much their blueprint on how the factory owners should be overthrown and what would happen during the revolution. There are some changes that happen to society and I'm going to talk specifically about Great Britain here because the United States is a little bit behind this. A lot of these labor reforms will happen in the United States in the 1880s going up until the 1920s. But in Britain, like I said, they're the first to do it. 
1832, there's the Sadler Report, and one of the articles you're writing today, or reading for this week, I should say, maybe not today, but for this week, is a set of interviews that were done with British factory workers during the Sadler Report investigation. The Sadler Report in 1832 documented all sorts of child labor and led to the British Parliament passing the Factory Act of 1833. And the Factory Act of 1833, it set a minimum age of nine for a factory worker. If you were between the ages of nine and 13, you were limited to an eight hour workday. And if you were between the ages of 13 and 18, you were limited to a 12 hour workday. So those are kids between the ages of nine and 13 working up to eight hours in a factory. Just let that sink in for a moment. In 1848, Parliament passes the 10 hours act, which limited women and children to a total of 58 hours of work. Now why 58 hours of work? It's because you work six days. The Mines Act of 1842 will prohibit underground employment of girls, women, and children. Overall pay will increase in Britain by about 50% but that's 50% of not a lot. And if you were a woman, you got paid less than a man. If you, got, if you were a child, you got paid even less than a woman did. Part of this industrialization is the women's suffrage movement. Uh, the women's suffrage movement, it's a movement in both Europe and the United States that demanded that women be allowed to vote. Uh, some of these groups were the National Society for Women's Suffrage, the Women's Social and Political Union, the French League of Women's Rights, and the Union of German Workers' Organizations. And here in the United States, there was the National Women's Party and National Women's Suffrage Association. Some of the leaders of this you may have heard of, some maybe you didn't. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, Susan B. Anthony are the big ones, but you can't forget Emmeline Pankhurst either. By the end of the 1800s, cities in Britain, cities in Europe, and cities in the United States start to offer public water, public sewer. That helps with the sanitation, that helps with some of the pollution. Thomas Edison is gonna be the one who perfects the light bulb, and Thomas Edison is going to bring lights to homes. And overall, because the work is much more mechanized, because there are are many more labor-saving devices being used, you're working less, you're making a little bit more, and you have some free time for the first time. And so sports like cricket, soccer, rugby, cycling, boxing, running, and even baseball, and eventually basketball become the leisure time activities that people would do when they were off work. And we're still not done. With industrialization come new types of science. Uh, atomic theory is discovered by a guy named Hendrik Lorentz. Uh, Hendrik Lorentz is going to discover electrons. Uh, Wilhelm Röntgen is going to discover x-rays. And then Antoine Bacquerel and Marie Curie are going to discover the idea of radioactivity. Put all those things together and that's where you get the modern day atomic theory. Uh, quantum theory. Max Planck suggested that matter and energy are interchangeable. Uh, basically that light is a form of energy. And if light and energy are the same, that means matter, substance, is a form of energy. Ernest Rutherford is going to do some atomic theory research and he's going to discover you know what radioactive atoms give off energy and they give off this energy in the form of light as they disintegrate. Albert Einstein I gave him his own little category he argued that space and time were relative to each other 
And he argued that matter and energy are linked together. And when you put space and time being relative, and when you put that motion and energy all linked together, that's where he came up with his ground bake, uh, breaking E equals MC squared. And then you got Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is going to propose the theory of evolution and the idea of natural selection. Uh, he would say that species evolve to fill a certain niche and species evolve to best be suited for their environment. And this becomes known as survival of the fittest. And you can see there Mr. Einstein with his um, very famous hairdo. Psychology. This is the time where Sigmund Freud is going to draw connections between dreams and the human subconsciousness. Um, much of what Sigmund Freud did has been discredited or changed, but he is going to be the creator of the idea of psychoanalysis. Uh, he would psychoanalyze you. He would analyze your dreams and then try and interpret what your dreams meant in terms of your subconscious. And he came up with this idea of the id, ego, and superego. Uh, the id is the irrational part of your mind, the uh, like the temper tantrum throwing toddler. The ego is the realistic part of the mind. It is the, the no-nonsense part of your brain. And then you have the super ego, which is the moral part of your brain, the part of your brain that refuses to accept that you can do wrong. And Sigmund Freud believes that it is these three parts of the human mind that are fighting for control. And it is the ego that is supposed to keep the id and the super ego in check and give you uh, kind of a balance um, in your consciousness. Friedrich Nietzsche, who is this gentleman right here, um, he believed that rational thought would lead you to an intellectual truth. And he came up with this idea that people who had willpower and were able to use their willpower to keep themselves under control were supermen. And individuals who maintained both their rational thought and their willpower, the supermen, if you will, would be able to lead others to the truth and would help others understand that rational thought leads to intellectual truth. Um, Nietzsche got into some trouble. Uh, he believed that Christianity held people back because it was such a moral religion. Uh, basically, he said Christians are slaves to their own morality. And what really got him in trouble is he made the argument that God is dead because the world was all about rationality and black and white. We have some arts because we haven't really talked about arts in this class, which I, I hate, but it works better in a face-to-face -face setting to talk about art. But um, you've got the idea of cubism. If you're a fan of Pablo Picasso, he uses a lot of cubic shapes in his artwork. He also uses geometric forms other than cubes. And it's all about perspective. And what Pablo Picasso would try to do is he would try to paint multiple perspectives into one work of art. Uh, Claude Monet, he is a great example of Impressionism, and he used these short, broad brush strokes where if you look at it up close, it doesn't look like much, but if you look at it from far away, you get, you know, breathtaking pictures of flowers and people in parks and uh, lily pads and, and everything else. And he kept his colors separate because you had to use your mind to get the impression of what the colors and what the images were supposed to be. And his big thing was to try and capture the moment. He wanted to capture what the impression of a particular scene was in his mind or what the impression of a particular 
moment in time was in his mind. Literature is going to mock society. Uh, for example, Charles Dickens talks all about how dark and dirty the cities were. Mark Twain is going to mock the division between the rural and urban areas. And a woman in Ayn Rand, she's a little bit later than this, but she's going to, in many ways, mock what um, life looks like as far as the haves and haves nots. Now, something that I am interested in myself is music. And um, Richard Wagner, who is a German composer of the late 1800s, uh, well, mid 1800s, I should say, uh, he comes up with this idea called the light motif. And in Richard Wagner's work, whenever a new character was represented or a new character was on stage, they would get this melodic um, jingle, if you will, a, a melodic phrase that is meant to represent that character. And whenever that character reappeared in his work, that melodic phrase would be repeated to remind you that that person is present on stage. Arnold Schoenberg is going to come up with the idea of atonal or 12-tone music. And Schoenberg and others like him will use a mathematical formula to create a, a tone row. And in this tone row, every tone of the of the mathematical equation, every note of the mathematical equation must be used in some way, shape, or form before you can repeat any notes. And you can re go from front to back, you can go back to front. Um, there are just different ways that you can represent this tone row and have it in the music. And then uh, Claude Debussy, or Debussy, if you will, for the French pronunciation, uh, he comes up with this idea called chord planing. And in chord planing, you play a piano or some other instrument, and you maintain your harmonic intervals when, as you move the chords around, and it creates this very full, very like dreamlike sound, if you will. Um, romance period, romantic period in music is fantastic. If you're not familiar with this period of classical music, Wagner, Debussy, Brahms, late Beethoven. There's a lot of good stuff in the 1800s. All right, if you are looking at the PowerPoint, you'll see this last slide is a video. It's a video of one of my favorite pieces uh, it's the Overture to Tristan und Isolde. And if you get a few minutes, listen to it. And if you listen to it, send me an email back and tell me what you think of it. And if I get an email back, tell me what you think about it. And you actually take time to listen to it. I'll give you a couple extra points for, for taking your time and doing it. Um, and I just appreciate it. But um, this is our last video before spring break. I just want to tell everybody have a safe spring break. Have fun. And when we come back, I'll start talking more about the SLO essay. I'll start sending a couple of videos on how to actually format it, how to do it, how to do your, your footnotes and all of that information. I know you're just dying to learn. So I may actually record some of that during spring break for you and have it ready for you. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, anything like that, just let me know and I'm here to help you. Hope you have a good week and a good spring break. We'll talk to you later. See ya.